Dirios, it's David McGillivray here, and this is Little Did You Know, it's a chat show in which I talk to people I find interesting. I hope you agree. Uh, the time here in the UK is eight minutes past five. In uh, Los, a Los Angeles, it's um, eight minutes past nine in the morning, and that's where my guest is. Uh, he wasn't born there, though. Um, he's one of the board of the directors of the Los Angeles Historic Theatre Foundation, which aims to preserve beautiful picture palaces. And there's more of them that have survived in America that you, than you may think. Um, uh, every, every so often they, they host webinars and I participated in a couple and at these webinars uh, there's all kinds of interesting information. Everybody taking part is so knowledgeable and quite often there are films made inside these wonderful buildings including little nooks and corners that often the public aren't privy to. Um, so uh, that's uh, that's the background of the L A H T F, an acronym I can never uh, remember. Uh, we want to find out uh, more about uh, my guest because uh, I noticed on these webinars that this guy hasn't got an American accent. I think he's a Scot. So I want to know what a Scot is doing in L A. and also how the City of Angels is coping with the reopening of cinemas. Answers, answers to all those questions and more as I ask you to say hello to the very wonderful Mike Hume. Hi there everybody and uh, David thank you so much for uh, asking me along to, to join in with things. It's fantastic to, to be talking to, to you all the way from, from LA and hopefully with a bit of an international audience for us. I do believe that that is a possibility. As with the uh, LAHTF, uh, your audience is uh, international. Now, I'm delighted to see um, that you have that light uh, behind you. Tell us what kind of a light that is, please. So, so this big beast here is is actually from the UK. It is uh, it's fr from uh, the the company that did a lot of stage lighting in the UK in the 20th century, which was Strand Lighting or, or Rank Strand. And this this beast is a is a 2000 watt Fresnel light that would have been used in larger theatres, probably over 1500 seats and television studios as well, of course. And the, the reason I have it is that I used to be very involved in doing theatrical lighting design in the UK. And when I moved to the US uh, some years ago, it's very unionized here. And unless you're doing it professionally, you're not really involved. So I bought a bunch of these, um, or I've collected these old lights over the years. And it reminds me of my connection to technical theater. So, it, and it's fun to have them in the background. It, it's something to talk about. You've answered so many of my questions. <laughs> All at once, I was going to point out that that light is a link to your uh, previous career here in the UK as a, a lighting designer. Yes, uh, lighting designer and sort of technical director. I, I started off doing lighting design um, when I was about 13. I got very interested in technical theatre uh, because my father was the stage manager of the local Edinburgh Gilbert and Sullivan Society. And they were, they, they put on shows in the 1350 seater uh, King's Theatre in Edinburgh, which is one of the, the sort of, um, you know, top level roadhouses in, in the UK. And so I got to go along every year when they were doing their show. And it was a very professional, but still amateur uh, group. And I just, you know, the interest just sparked from there and it led to me doing lighting design and then ultimately uh, technical management where I would be project managing a whole show up until 7.30 p.m. on opening night. And then I'd, the show would run and I'd start planning the show coming out. Um, and the, the staff at the King's Theatre were so fantastic that I actually, um, 
when we used to go and see pantomimes there, we were allowed to go backstage afterwards. And I met people like Stanley Baxter, um, which was just, you know, seeing greats like that do their thing on the stage was just amazing. Um, so yeah, that, and I, I also got to meet Francis Reed, who will be known to many as the, the sort of father of stage light, lighting techniques in the UK. So that's where it all came from. So at this stage, uh, let's just do a, a bit of housekeeping, and that is that in uh, in the UK we tend to call cinemas cinemas and theatres theatres, but in America they call cinemas and theatres theatres. But because Mike has worked in theatres, uh, we're going to keep to that format. This is getting very boring already, but I'm uh, I'm I'm now going to talk about theatres uh, because you you tour to quite a few in the UK. And was it about this time that you developed an interest in in uh, beautiful historical theatres? That's right. Yes, uh, I combined my other interest of photography uh, with theatres and um, several. I, I guess it aligned with my thinking when several people told me that I seem to have an ability to to capture the feeling of being inside these buildings through a still photograph, which is quite difficult to do, um, you know, through a still photograph. Um, but it's all about the lines and, and what the human eye sees and what you, you take in. And I guess the combination of the two hobbies then became something useful uh, to, to then used for preservation and interest and documentation. And how is it that we are now speaking to you um, actually in a in a hotel room in Woodland Hills, which is uh, north of L.A.? Uh, how how was this? Uh, um, how did this happen? How are you in L.A.? Right. So it's a, a really good question. Uh, and I worked for an international company for uh, about 20 years straight out of straight out of university. And that took me to several countries, Canada, Australia, the US. And in two, two, 2010, I was asked to come over to Los Angeles. And what was intended to be two years turned into four years, then turned into moving permanently and then in 2019 turned into me becoming an American citizen, which is, is quite a quite a step. Um, but the practicalities are that I retain UK citizenship. So I, I would only have done that on the basis that I was not dropping that. And yeah, so I've now been here 11 years. Los Angeles is what the second largest city in North America. It's a very large playground. And whereas most people think of LAX and congested freeways or motorways, LA is a city of cities. And when you find your spot, the place that, that you like, your tribe, if you like, it is a great place to, to be because there's, there's so much going on in such a large place. It's like London. You can't help but have culture and things of interest for anybody. You just need to go find it. And this, Los Angeles is not great at advertising what's going on. There's a lot of cultural things happen, but you need to dig to, to, to find out about them. Um, but, and specifically on theatres, you know, we have 88 cities in the county of Los Angeles. And with that comes community theatres. And by that, I mean like single screen cinemas that are there to serve a small city um, and smaller theatres up to the large show places and the, the grand theatres. And we actually have the largest historic collection of uh, historic movie theatres in Los Angeles, not anywhere else. So that's an interesting fact. How long did it take you to fit into what is a very different society and lifestyle? Yeah, I think it, um, in different ways, you know, you, you integrate in um, your social life first and the people that you're working with. The, the situation that I came into in Los Angeles was a slightly unhappy acquisition. So um, friends at work were not something that was coming easily. <laughs> um, so, you know, you're looking to your social life for, for how you're getting to, to know people. And in a city as big as Los Angeles, you have to get out and explore. You, you physically have to go drive places. Our 
transport infrastructure you know for buses and trains is not great and that in itself could be the topic of a whole other discussion uh, they are trying to fix it and they're doing a good job but you have to get out and about and explore and i know people who have not done that and they stay in their bubble in los angeles and they could be living anywhere they could be in south dakota um but you've got to You've got to go out and and you know see find what's of interest to you um, and or know what's of interest to you and go find where it's happening, and that's how I got into seeing shows, uh, attending theatre tours and discovering this group, the, the LA Historic Theatre Foundation, who look to preserve and protect all these fantastic theatres and movie palaces. Uh, you told me that uh, you became involved uh, with the foundation um, because of a rather disappointing tour that you took. That's right, David. Yes, I, I went on one of their tours and uh, the way that LAHTF work physical in-person tours is that it's not just an hour long tour. They will do, uh, they, they'll have the, man the manager or the operator of the theatre present on stage. You know, we recently did, recently before the pandemic, we did an event at Grauman's Chinese and uh, that's the largest IMAX screen in the, the US and the only one in the world with a curtain. So there you are. Um, they have laser IMAX projection there. We had the CEO of IMAX come along and talk to people about how that works specifically in the theatre. Anyway, I digress. We then spend several hours doing very intimate tours from from the basement under the stage all the way to the projection booth and backstage, and it's through a lot of detail. And I attended one of these tours at another theatre, and I realised that I could answer questions that the tour guide was being was being asked, but didn't have answers for. And of course, you don't want to jump in. You don't. You you, you can't more than once or twice jump in and like it seems like you're taking over somebody's tour and that's what got me into volunteering with the the foundation and then after about three years i actually they approached me to to join their board and i've been on the board now for three and a half years yes so um uh, you've been with them since uh, 2018 yes now this is a generalization but uh, give me your take on it americans are not good at preserving old buildings right and the, the, you know there's that that is a general take on things and, and i think that um when when you look at preservation ordinances in, in the US, then what is old? You know, people people talk about old things in Los Angeles being, our, our oldest restaurant is I think 110 or 108 years old, which is the Musso and Frank Grill in Hollywood. I'm sure some of your audience will be familiar with it. But LA has a terrible reputation for just ripping down something because it's not it's not in vogue anymore, and let's replace it with something else. Um, but there has been a groundswell of movement since the, the late eighties to preserve the the things that are that are important and uh, you know mean something to our society. And in the theatre world, well, I, I guess in the non-theatre world that happened with the Los Angeles City Library which was, you know, your grand old city library that you see in, in many cities in the UK included. And that was going to be ripped down for, for redevelopment. And there was a group called the Los Angeles Conservancy, which is the largest member-based uh, historic preservation group in the United States, that was largely formed from that. And there was another theatre called the Wiltern, which is an art deco, beautiful, stunning theatre. And uh, the, it, it wasn't quite people lying down in front of bulldozers, but it came to, you know, bulldozers on site, last minute reprieves. Uh, and out of that, uh, there was a real groundswell in Los Angeles of historic preservation coming to the fore and being part of the larger discussion. And now we see, for instance, a couple of weeks ago, Apple Computer have just spent over 20 million restoring a theatre, which is their new flagship Apple store across the whole US, and it's stunning. 
So attitudes are changing. Now, can you um, list briefly, perhaps, um, uh, some of the cinemas that you, your foundation, have prevented from being demolished? Sure. Um, so one that will be familiar, in fact, two that will be familiar to your audience, to anybody that knows or has visited Los Angeles, are Grauman's Chinese Theatre in Hollywood and right across the street, the El Capitan Theatre. And Grauman's Chinese, I, I don't think it was ever in any danger of being demolished, um, you know, because it, it's been historic since its, its opening day with King of Kings uh, premiering there. But or premier, premiering, I should say. Um, but uh, when IMAX came to Grauman's Chinese, um, there were plans to do different things than what it ended up being. And the, the Historic Theatre Foundation's involvement there uh, really helped protect the asset that, that that auditorium is. And instead of doing changes that might have looked a bit horrific now, um, we were very involved in, in helping ensure that it stayed in the same theme and looks the same way. And practical terms, what do I mean? It was very shallow seating before, it's now much steeper, um, but that wasn't necessarily going to be done in a way that preserved how the rest of it looked. And that the El Capitan Theatre, uh, which just recently celebrated its 95th birthday and the 30th uh, anniversary of its reopening as a first run Disney, uh, theater, uh, cinema um, in Hollywood. That the original intention there, uh, which we backed up with with you know newspapers from the the day, was that it was going to be split. This 1926 auditorium was going to be split into two, and nothing of the interior was was going to be preserved. Our founder at the time went crawling inside the attic space and found that bits still existed. And ultimately we persuaded Disney that a full restoration of the theater was justified. And that's what we have today. And uh, this is only a, a, a little reminder, but uh, of course, Grauman's is the, the cinema with the handprints out front. Um, what is the saddest loss which cinema do you really regret was demolished i think um i think i would say and that this varies per person for me i'm gonna say that the the warner uh, theater or you know, warner cinema we would call it in the uk in beverly hills was a pretty big loss it's now a parking lot and you know there's there's it was demolished to make way for a building that did not get permission to be put up and unfortunately the uh the city rules have are, are still not developed that they will let you demolish something without having properly baked plans to build something to replace it so if you if you wind back the clock even further, we had uh, in Los Angeles and downtown the Philharmonic Auditorium. So like many large American cities, you have a huge space, you know, 5000 plus seat space, which is used for the biggest events and concerts in, in the city. And the Philharmonic Auditorium was pulled down and nothing built there until about five years ago. But it's the Warner that really gets me because the bulldozers came in when there was a meeting at City Hall about not demolishing it. The owner just ignored the permits to pay the fine to, to demolish it while there was a meeting going on about saving it. The, the same sort of thing ha, has happened in the UK. Famously, the, the, the Firestone building was demolished deliberately over a bank holiday. Oh, that's, a, that's another matter. Um, when was the Warner demolished, Mike? Oh, I need to check my notes, but I want to say early 80s or thereabouts. So you, you obviously, you, you never visited. What was so wonderful about it? Well, that, that, those, David, were what we call the Warner triplets, which is where um, a very prolific designer, um, Scottish, actually, a guy called uh, B. Marcus Proteka, and a uh, uh, prolific muralist called Anthony Heinzbergen, 
they collaborated on three theatres for the Warner chain at their expansion stage. And they were gorgeous um, Art Deco theatres. One of them is still a, a live events and entertainment space in, in a city called San Pedro to the south of, of Los Angeles. The second one, the Warner Huntington Park, still exists but has been adaptively reused as a gym and LHTF was involved in ensuring that the, that the leveling of the floor was done in a way that could be uh, undone if it was to revert to theatrical use and that historic artifacts like seating were kept on site because as, as we all know if you don't keep historic stuff on site it goes wandering or people forget where it is um so so you, you, and the third theatre, of course, in Beverly Hills has, was demolished years and years ago. So you have three triplets, uh, gorgeous Art Deco designs. One got demolished, one is now a gym, and the third one is still being used for its original design intention. Um, and just one little postscript, those, those two guys, Prateka and Heinsbergen, then went on to uh, work together on the Hollywood Pantages Theatre, which is the other one that folks watching this will be familiar with. If you've been, if you've come to LA and you've seen a show, you've probably gone to see it at the Pantages Theatre. I, I have, and I did, and I saw how to succeed in business without really trying there. And it was magnificent. Now you've uh, said you've got three interests, obviously historic theatres and photography are two of them, but I didn't expect the third. You're a petrol head. And uh, in fact, if uh, you look up pictures of um, Mike online, you can see him in his motorcycle leathers. How, how long has this been going on, Mike? Well, I'd always had an interest in motorcycles when I lived in the UK, but the risk was not worth the reward. Um, you know, I it, it didn't want to get caught in the rain. A lot of the, the country roads, I, I lived in the southwest for, for a few years, and there's a lot of country lanes and bits to explore. But with the hedges and everything, you really can't see if there's a car coming towards you in the middle of the road. So the risk never seemed worth the reward. When you flip that over to Southern California, where the weather is, you know, 21 degrees and sunny every day, and there's zero, virtually zero risk of rain, it then becomes something where you can get out and about, you can get to places that you would never go in a car because it's just that much further. And when you're in a car, it, the travel is about getting to the destination. When you're on a motorcycle, it's also about the journey you have even if you're in horrible traffic you still have fun making that journey so so that's something that's unique to the southern california lifestyle um, just a quick question before we take a break mike have you traveled route 66 i've not i've only done the first part from so it starts at it used to start in downtown at the intersection of seventh and state which is where our most prolific uh, historic movie palace is the state theater um the uh, but but it now starts at santa monica um Har the santa monica pier so i've only gone from there to roughly about um the vegas uh eastwards which is not very far uh, and it doesn't go through Vegas. My point is that's about how far east I've gone. But I'd love to do it one day. Well, obviously you must. Um, we're going to take a, a short break now uh, to see a trailer for a Peccadillo picture called Consequences. It's from Slovenia. And uh, my uh, glamorous assistant, I'm sure, will correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a chance you may not have seen this because it's only uh, been released on uh, VOD, video on demand. It's only streaming. Have a look at this and join us again in, an, in a couple of minutes. Obsednik se zbudiš, ustaneš, pa imaš ponosnik zajtrk. Obosnik imaš pa učne ure. In kako ti je tle? Ne, peč. Glej, najbolj še se zasevim. Kaj pa si za kakaj biznesa, ne? Da nisem kaj. Ste na odnarja, pa slam. Pum, pum, pum. Kaj imaš denar? 
Ja. Kaj s tobom? Hajde, vse in vsej gremo. Po pičke jebote. Kaj pičke? Kaj zdaj? Kako to misliš? Ko ti nakažem razfuka, nekaj pa skoči na enega. Od nam smo prišli. Kaj pa la nudiš? Z rihta je pa me pokliči pol. Zdaj se je tukaj sta, da boš moral začeti prevzimati odgovornost za svoje dejanje, a ne? Fukin ti! Kam ne zdaj grem? Jaz sem tukaj, ne moraš biti. Vse se plača. Um, that's consequences. It's uh, <clears throat> from uh, Slovenia. And the first comment under the trailer on YouTube is, God, they are all gorgeous. Well, apt observation. I'm David McGillivray, and with me is uh, Mike Hume, one of the board of directors of the Los Angeles Historic Theatre Foundation. He um, travels not only America, but also the world, taking the most magnificent photos. And some of them you can see at historictheaterphotos.com. And we'll put that address on the YouTube page. Um, Mike, you've been with the LAHTF since uh, 2018. We can all uh, be members. It's only $35 a year. Um, what do we get for that subscription? Well, uh, David, for that, we, we're actually looking at how we um, give virtual members benefits. You know, when COVID came along, um, LAHTF, we, we sat in a board meeting, we had an in-person theatre tour planned and clearly it, it couldn't happen. So we said, what do we do? And we thought, let's try turning it into a video and we could present it on Zoom. And we didn't want to charge for it because we weren't sure um, how it was going to be received, how well we would do. Um, and that just snowballed into us creating content um, in a flurry of activity, particularly over the summer. Um, I, and it, ultimately, a couple of, uh, what, a month ago, we were at the Hollywood Legion Theatre just down the road from the Hollywood Bowl, and we had a combined in-person and virtual Zoom event uh, where we the people on Zoom saw us walk into the theatre with an auditorium full of socially distanced, you know, sort of 100 people in a, in a theatre, talk about the theatre, have a Q&A and then tour around the theatre. It was fantastic. Um, but the question for us is, where do we go now? Our virtual events are not going away. We have, on average, 300 people coming along to the events we do, and that covers nine countries outside of the US, which is not something we initially sought, but is fantastic. It's a great conversation that we have internationally, and I really value, and I, I hope others value as well. So um, in person, we have tours and discounts. You know, you go to Grauman's and you'll get free popcorn and a, and a drink uh, with membership, but you then get priority access to all our tours and everything we do in person. We're trying to work out how we make virtual benefits work. All our content, we will be putting it online, but we want to do it in a secure way that, that people can't rip it off. So we have members only events, for instance, uh, one of the theatres that we did was all about, there was a projection system so that if you were, if you turned up outside the door, you could see the movie that was being played on the big screen. And we spent an hour exploring all of that system. So um, that's the kind of thing that we do for, for your money. Uh, Mike, when were you last in the UK? That would be December 2019, and uh, I, I'm always back every Christmas. I like to get back more often than that. Uh, and it was such an amazing trip because I had the, the great honour of touring around the Theatre Royal Drury Lane with a hard hat on. Uh, when it was covered in scaffolding and I got up, I got to stand on the roof of the Theatre Royal Drury Lane and, and look out over Covent Garden, clamber all through the stage house and, and front of house 
And then we also went to Her Majesty's Theatre where Phantom of the Opera is. And had I known that that was all going to be ripped out of there and, and a new modernised set fitted in, I mean, we clambered two levels under the stage amongst the Victorian stage machinery that was partially the inspiration for how that designer's set went into Phantom of the Opera. And it's all in pristine condition. It was an amazing trip. There were other theatres as well outside of London, but those are the two most prolific. So I'm looking forward to coming back. So you haven't been here since uh, lockdown. Let me bring you up to speed. So last March, all cinemas and theatres in the UK closed. And um, then in, in the summer, some of them opened and in September I, I saw a film called Tenet, which was which was virtually the only new film that was shown. Um, but then, of course, subsequently everything closed again. And uh, now here we are in uh, in June and um, most cinemas in the UK are now reopened now. Uh, let's talk about uh, the movie capital of the world. So what was it like this, this past year in Los Angeles with no cinemas open? It's been, it's been bizarre, absolutely bizarre. Uh, you know, you're used to Hollywood Boulevard being closed twice, if not three times a week for premieres. Uh, not so much for the, for the, you know, the stars on the Walk of Fame, but easily between the El Capitan and the Chinese theatre, they're, they're doing two premieres, maybe three per week. And all of that stopped. Um, the, it just started uh, a few weeks ago for uh, Disney's premiere of, of Luca. Is, it, is that how it's pronounced? Luca? Anyway, um, I'm not into my big, I'm not bigly into my, I just said bigly. <laughs> I'm not largely into my animated Disney Disney movies. Anyhow, um, you have so many people working in this industry in the in in Los Angeles with events, with promotion. Um, you know, just one event employs hundreds of people, and it all just stopped. And I and people kind of looked and thought this was going to last for a month. And then 15 months later, we're still in, in the same position. Um, you know, I was, I was at um, a, a Dodger Stadium last night, David, at the, the Dodgers were playing the Cubs. And it was cathartic. It was, it was like a return. The place was full and hardly anybody was wearing a mask. Um, California went for the mask thing massively. And we're now um, well over... 50% vaccination. I think it, the, the numbers are high 70s for people who are, you know, had first doses. Um, California did very well because of the mask thing. And it un, until a week ago, uh, until a few weeks ago, I would be wearing a mask wherever I went outside the, the house. And that, that helped a lot. But cinemas and, and sports events and everything is now opening back up. I just hope that we didn't lose too many people from the industry to other places, or we will pull new people in and, and train people. But, you know, movie production has still has been going on, but it costs so much more money and everybody is wearing masks. So um, looking forward to all coming back full, full scale. And what is the situation at the moment, Mike? Have all cinemas in Los Angeles now reopened? Not all of them, no. And some of your um, viewers may be familiar that one of the, the large Los Angeles chains called Pacific Theatres um, made a shock announcement a couple of weeks ago that they would not be reopening their movie theatre chains. And they are largely Southern California based, um, which is a way of saying LA and the greater metro area. Um, and they so it's a curious situation, uh, David, because they chose not to file for bankruptcy, which is a very American thing to do if your uh, organization has run out of cash and has racked up the debts, then you can do a chapter 11 bankruptcy, restructure the company. Um, people that are owed money uh, get whatever money is there. But the point is, uh, a phoenix rises out the flames. And Pacific Theatres didn't do that. They just said, we're done. And that includes the historic Cinerama Dome, 
which a lot of people have concerns about. So whereas some movie theatres are opening, we've lost some big operators and no one yet knows what's going to happen there. We're going to talk about the Cinerama Dome in uh, just a minute, Mike. But first of all, I'm going to tell you my personal story about um, um, visiting Los Angeles. It was in 1991. I was uh, directing a play there and I wanted to go downtown. And my friend say, oh, said, oh, you can't, you can't go down there. You'll, you'll be killed. And of course, that was like a red rag to a bull. I wanted to see those movie palaces. And this is my diary from October the 6th. 1991 I went to the Los Angeles theater which was the one I really wanted to see and and this is what I said it offers three films for three dollars every day from 11 a.m. the foyer is majestic on a par with the Kilburn State that's a, a cinema back here in uh, London you may be familiar with it uh, Mike um, there's acres of room in a downstairs lobby, seemingly unused. Regrettably, the lights were kept low in the auditorium, but I could pick out a ceiling painting which looked as though it was along the lines of the Sistine Chapel. How do these huge barns survive in LA? A mere scattering of patrons were there until I left at 4 p.m. Well, the answer to that question I asked is that it wasn't that long after that that I think the Los Angeles Theatre stopped showing films. That's right, David. Um, uh, however, I am pleased to say that the, the Broadway Theatre Group, um, which is headed up uh, by a family called the Delijanis. Uh, they own four theatres on in, in downtown. The Los Angeles Theatre is one of them, and they keep it open for special events and filming. And you will have seen that theatre, parts of that theatre appear in so many TV and movies, um, that, and you don't necessarily recognise it as being that theatre. So the gorgeous foyer that you talked about has been has been used to double as the Vatican uh, and a, a nightclub. Uh, the downstairs is a gorgeous circular ladies powder room. And it was the jewelry store in the Batman movie, which had uh, the Joker, I forget, um, Jim Carrey, when Jim Carrey played the Joker. Uh, they used that as the jewelry store and it was only 15 seconds of screen time. Uh, the basement, the oval basement lounge that you talk about has been used in numerous films, appearing as a hotel lobby um, and a ballroom. And none of this is the actual auditorium. It's a fantastic theatre and it's actually my favourite theatre in Los Angeles. And it was built in only six months. This uh, I, I learned uh, uh, on one of your uh, webinars and they're absolutely marvellous because sometimes you show clips from the films that have been shot in these cinemas, and that's absolutely marvellous. Now, let's let's get back to the Cinerama Dome, because uh, Alan Jones, who's going to be my uh, guest in a couple of weeks, he organises Fright Fest, which is happening again this year. Um, he told me that the, it looked as though the Cinerama Dome wasn't going to reopen. Tell us, Mike, why is this a unique cinema in LA? Yeah, well, the, the, the Cinerama Dome is the world's only geodesic concrete dome structure. And originally, there were, this was planned to be a cheaper way to roll out cinemas half the cost at double the, the speed. And as happens with these things, not all things went to plan. And the dome went four times over budget. And so it was the only one ever built. Um, it was built originally to showcase uh, the Cinerama process. Uh, which was three projectors um, projecting onto a screen that was um, not far off 180 degrees. So a, a very deeply curved screen. And the concept was, you know, this was all coming at a time when television was dominating. And the movie industry was saying, how do we capture people? How do we get people back into the movie theatres, into cinemas? And the answer was widescreen. When televisions were this, they said, let's do this. And so Cinerama was the ridiculous extrapolation of how far that went. And the process was too complex and eventually got dumbed down into what they call single camera Cinerama, which is where you have just one 
uh, camera and therefore one projector when it comes to, to time to show it. But the dome is is a fantastic, you know, in the round theater. There are only two other cinemas which can still show that three projector cinerama process. One is in Seattle and the other one is at the Brad for the, the Media Museum in Bradford, UK. Correct, correct. But the but the fee the feeling now is that there's no way the Cinerama Dome is going to be demolished. That's right, uh, David. You know, um, this the question came up uh, twenty years ago as well because Pacific Theatres was trying to uh, reinvent things a little bit, and, and that's when they came up with their ArcLight brand, which was one of the first. Uh, cinema brands to have reserved seating no trailers on the movie presentation you'd be shown to your seat you know it was a it was a top end movie experience and the question then came up of what the dome was what was going to happen to the dome and as people said at the time the geodesic dome structure does not lend itself to many uses i think the other two best uses that i saw suggested were to either make it a bowling center uh, a set of bowling alleys or an ice rink. But um, with the technology at the time, you couldn't outfit it with the, you know, the, the ducting required to put, for instance, a large catering kitchen in it. So it was limited in the terms of uses. But I also think that we are now at a place 20 years after that, where there are just too many people that love the dome and love going to see movies there and will not let it turn into anything else. That's what I like to hear. Now, let's briefly talk about another couple of cinemas, uh, one of which we've already mentioned. Uh, they will be familiar to people all over the world. And the first one is, well, Grauman's Chinese, although I gather it's no longer called Grauman's. Is that right? Naming rights, yes. Dollars for, for naming rights. It's officially called the TCL Chinese Theatre. Uh, the, the Chinese company TCL bought those naming rights, I think, uh, certainly 15 years ago, if not longer. But everybody calls it Grauman's. <laughs> and, and what about one of the most famous cinemas in the world? Um, I went there and I saw uniformed ushers and a stage show. Even in the 1970s, I can only be talking about Radio City Music Hall. Yeah, one of the most fantastic live per events, performance spaces in the world. Um, and as we highlighted in, in our uh, a session that we did in January, we, we had uh, Rosemary Novellino Mearns join us um, from New York, who was on the, the Radio City Ballet at the time when Radio City Management announced that that, that amazing building was set to be demolished. Um, you know, there was no question that this was what they were going to do. And if you ever wanted a David and Goliath story, that is it. Rosie went home that night, having been told in December that she was only working to the end of the April show. She was not a rocket, by the way. She was in the ballet company, which is, is a different, uh, different group. Oh, and let's just mention the Rockettes were the famous chorus line. Absolutely, yeah, and they, but they all, and there was this ballet company as as well, and she went home that night and couldn't sleep because she just felt fundamentally this decision was wrong. And the next day she came into the to to work and just started talking to all of her colleagues about how wrong this was, and the snowball started gathering pace. They went downtown, they, they talked to people, they called up NBC, the, you know, the equivalent of the BBC News, and just talked to people until somebody started sparking an interest. Uh, they went out in costume to, to picket, I guess, the, the lines of people coming in to see the show, saying, sign this bit of paper, because in four months they want to pull this place down. And ultimately the place was landmarked and saved, and, and now we would never think of pulling it down. Radio City is safe. What marvellous news. We're approaching the uh, end of the show, unfortunately, but I want to uh, continue this conversation on Patreon. And I believe for the first time on this series, Mike, it's going to be possible to actually show your photos 
of the cinemas we're going to be talking about. Is that true? That's right, David. Yeah, I'm looking forward to letting you guys see a little insight into some of our beautiful theatres. That's what I wanted to know. Mike, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, today from Los Angeles. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, join us, Patreon subscribers, right now because we're waiting for you. And if you're not a Patreon subscriber, this is the link you can join us it's so easy to become one of the gang join me again uh, next week when my guest will be penny diamond she's an actress i've worked with several times and she organizes the most astonishing large scale productions sometimes with a cast of more than a hundred uh, join me then until then this is david mcgillivray saying bye bye <laughs>